I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're watching the Sonia Morton Firth Show. I'm live today from the Bloomsbury Hotel and I'm really excited because my guest has truly changed my life. My guest, Dr. John Demartini, is an author of 60 books, a world-renowned specialist in human behavior, and also played one of the key parts in the film, The Secret. He also speaks on stage and travels the world delivering his event that changes thousands of people's lives. I'm truly, truly honored to have Dr. John Demartini as a guest on my show today. John, I attended your breakthrough experience a year ago now. It's actually only been a year and it completely changed my life, uh, which I'll go on and talk about more. But what really blew me away, apart from my own breakthrough, my own experiences, was the depth of knowledge that you have. Um, where did your journey begin? Where did your pursuit of knowledge start? <laughs> um, I, I started working at overcoming my learning disabilities when I was 18, right to a week before my 18th birthday. And I had the opportunity to meet a gentleman named Paul Bragg, who one night in an hour of presentation inspired me to help me believe that I could overcome my learning problems because I had learning ch challenges mm -hmm. as a child. And I went on a pursuit to try to overcome those learning problems and I learned how to read at 18. And so you couldn't read before the age of 18? Well, I could get words down, but mm -hmm. formally reading a, a book from cover to cover, I never did. I made it through school. I dropped out of school when I was about 14, but I made it through school up until then by asking smart kids questions which is part of what I do today, ask questions. Yeah, yeah. But um, at age 18, uh, I moved from Hawaii, where I was living, to back to see my parents, because I was living as a surfer in North Shore of Oahu. And I moved back to Texas, and I took a GED, which is a high school equivalency test, and I guessed and I passed. And then I tried to go to college after that, and I failed. And so I had to go and learn how to overcome my learning problems, and with the help of my mom, we started studying 30 words a day out of a dictionary. And I had to spell them, pronounce them, put meaning to the sentence with them, and um, grow my vocabulary enough to be able to understand some of the things in school. And slowly but surely, with 30 words a day, it, it, you do, after a while, you do pretty well. <laughs> and I eventually passed school and I started to excel. And then I had this absolute thirst to get caught up with everybody else around me because they were smart kids and I was the, I always had to wear a dunce cap when I was a kid. And so I um, was very, very adamant about trying to overcome that and catch up with people and I just fell in love with learning. And I just, I started reading 18 to 20 hours a day. And what was um, that moment of sort of, I'm going to call it a breakthrough, that was there a moment, something that Paul had said to you that made you decide to go on this journey for the rest of your life or that took you down a certain path? Well, I, that night I just, for the first time, from the things he was saying, that we could create what we wanted in life, um, it just the way he said it and that his adamant certainty about it made me believe that maybe I could overcome my learning problems. I, it's not that I didn't, I was surfing and I was riding big waves and I was doing well in surfing, but I never thought I was going to be able to be smart, intelligent. And that was the first night I actually believed that I could. And then I went down the pathway to try to, to overcome that learning problem. And I ran into those snags initially. But then when I failed my first class in school, my mom saw me crying um, because I kept hearing my first grade teacher. My first grade teacher said I would never be able to read, never be able to write, never be able to communicate, never mount a thing, never go very far in life. I had speech problems as a child too. And when she came home and saw me crying, she finally said to me, she said, whether you become a great teacher, healer, and philosopher and travel the world like you say you want to do, whether you go back to riding giant waves in Hawaii like you've done, or whether you return to the streets and panhandle as a bum like you've done, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what. And when she said that, my hand went into a fist and I I said to myself, I want to amass this thing called reading, I want to amass this thing called studying and learning, I want to amass this thing called teaching and healing and philosophy, and I want to do whatever it takes, travel whatever distance, pay whatever price to give my service of love. And 
I don't want to let anybody on the face of the earth stop me now. And I had this determination moment that was like, I'm not stopping. And that's when I went into the room and I got a dictionary out and I made a commitment to read that dictionary and memorize that dictionary. And that presumably wasn't your first book. You've, you've read something. No, some the very book. first book I ever picked up was in Hawaii. And I was at a health food store and it had this little round swiveling rack. And uh, I went around and I saw this book with this long-haired hippie guy and this farmer guy on the front cover called Chico's Organic Gardening and Natural Living. <laughs> And the guy on the cover looked like me because I had long hair and a beard. Uh, and because I thought, well, that guy, if he wrote this book, I bet I could read it because he looks like me. And that was my reason for picking up that book. I didn't have anything knowledge about gardening. But I picked up that book, and I couldn't understand most of the book, but there's a lot of pictures with it. But it was a simple book on gardening. And that was the very first book I ever tried to read from cover to cover in my life. You haven't turned out a gardener, so that's one Well, actually, thing. I did. I actually uh -huh. did. When I moved back to Texas, I actually started a three-acre garden. And in a very short period of time, like the next year, I realized I need to bring that down to manageable. But I did some organic gardening um, when I was a teenager. A a starting at 18 to 19, 19 to 20, 20 to 21, I did organic gardening as, uh, to grow my own natural food. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I wanted natural food. I wanted to recover from my health issues too. So in terms of actually the health issues, because you, you started off life or oh, beginnings as, as a chiropractor. Before. No, no, I was speaking. My, my speaking career started at age 18. Mm -hmm. The first student I ever had was age 18. You were speaking at 18. Well, once I learned to read, um, I was starting, I was so adamant about it. I was just living in the library and people started to notice that I just lived in this library and would go to class, go back to the library. Mm -hmm. And finally, I, and I would be doing yoga in the class to take a break from reading. And this lady asked me to teach her yoga. That was my first student. A 375-pound Afro-American woman asked me to teach her yoga. But it meant so much to me for somebody to ask me for information. That was, like, unbelievable. And then I had this um, Persian gentleman from Tehran uh, ask me to teach a meditation because I was doing yoga and meditation at the time. And that meant a lot to me. And he's still my student. He's the longest student I've had. It's wow. 40, 47 years wow. almost. And then um, he went on to be a doctor of chiropractic also because it, I inspired him, he said. But then I had a German fellow ask me to teach him mathematics, uh, and it was like basic stuff, <laughs> real basic stuff. Yeah. But gradually a student came, a group of students came out, and they used to come to the library and ask me questions. And I really loved studying and asking, answering questions. Mm -hmm. So... When I finished my first two years of college, I went on to the University of Houston, and I started out in an outdoor park area. I used to do my yoga, and people would gather around and start asking me questions because that was a little bit different in those days, 75. Yeah. And so I started gathering people, and I would have an average of 100 to 150 people a day would gather around and asking questions and have a dialogue, which is one of my most inspiring things. And it, sometimes it would swell because people go, what's going on over there? And people would swell to fluctuate up to 400 people sometimes. And then on rainy days, we'd go into the cafeteria and we'd have, I'd have a class. So I've been teaching um, since 18, if you want to call it that. It's a starting. Okay. And then by the time I went to professional school, I started teaching six and seven nights a week, pretty well every night a week, um, 7 to 10 p.m. And I got up really early in the morning and I would speed read books and then I would teach that night whatever I read that morning. And because I developed speed reading after a while, I, I just I kept asking every single day what worked and what didn't work every single day on what was reading, and I kept notes. And how do I get faster and faster? I want to be able to catch up with all the other kids. And so I developed speed reading, and I got really fast in reading. And uh, my biggest day of reading was eleven thousand pages of material. Wow! And, and how many books do you think you've uh, read it was, today? It was over. Oh, today it's it's, it's thirty thousand three hundred books. So. And how do you actually know that? How do you remember? I keep, I keep a record of it. You, you keep a record of every single book that yeah. you've... Wow, that's... that's yeah, well, I, that's not true. I keep a record of the books that I formally read, but sometimes I'm in a, um, a seminar and, uh, or someplace like a bookstore, and I may speed read a book or something like that. I don't always keep record of those. But the ones that I've actually done, or the equivalent of a book, because now online... If I'm reading hundreds and hundreds of pages of material and it's online and it's articles, I'll summarize 250 pages of research as a book. So that's the content because I'm constantly reading things online now. And what took you from being um, a chiropractor working with the body 
to what you're doing today, which is Well, your I was group. doing this, the, the speaking and personal transformation, and human mm. transformation things, really from the beginning, because that's what I had to do. But I wanted to be a teacher, healer, philosopher. I studied pre-med in college, but I was never satisfied with the idea of that the body had too many organs or there was too mm. few drugs. Yes. I never believed in the medical model. Mm. I always believed that the power was within the body. Yes. And chiropractic matched philosophically. So I, I got involved in chiropractic because of the philosophy. Because I believed that I wanted to empower people with their health, not them dependent on things or remove things. So I became a chiropractor in my early 20s. 23 is when I started to uh, go to chiropractic college, uh, almost 24. And I graduated almost 28. And uh, so that was nearly 10 years of college by the time I would finished that. And I, I loved that, but I knew the very first person I ever hired in my practice, her name was Denise, I, I told her that here's our game plan. We're going to build a massive practice, and then we're gonna, I'm going to be traveling the world and speaking in five years from now. So it was mapped out what we're going to do. In 18 months, about three months into practice, I came across this book by Alec McKenzie, The Time Trap. And I read that book, and it really made a difference in my practice. And my practice literally went tenfold by applying some of the things that I learned in it about uh, time management and delegation. Yeah. And I ended up with five doctors working for me and 12 staff members in literally 18 months from going from scratch and had a very big practice. And then people started going, well, how did you do this? And they wanted me to go and teach them how to do that. And so I started in the health field and I did about a thousand doctors consulting and speaking to about a thousand different doctor's offices and franchises and speaking at conferences for health professionals originally. But then it kept going into different health professionals and eventually into different industries. But I knew that that was the path. I, that was mapped out before I even opened up my practice. So that was, that was the plan. I wanted to travel the world and go to every country and speak. That was, that was the dream. And in terms of what you've read, um, and you've, I know you've studied a lot of the different ologies and the universal laws etc and what's out there um, and I know you talk you talk about it through the breakthrough um, experience and, and, and your other events what is what is one of the one fundamental if, if there is such a thing as a as, as a fundamental law out there in the universe I know you've you've appeared in in the film the secret uh, and people talk about the law of attraction positive thinking affirmations what are your views around all of those things well, you asked four questions, I believe. I did. I'm so the first, question, the first question was, uh, what would be a universal principle? And one of the most universal principles that I've found in every discipline that I've studied, which is 300 now, uh, is the law of the one and the many. The law of the one and the many. The law of the okay. one and the many. The law of the one and the many says, as you approximate the one, you have forces to disperse it into the many. And as you approximate the many, you have forces to disperse it into the one. So, for instance, uh, radiation comes from a point source and radiates out to an infinite number of radii, so one to many. Mm -hmm. But gravitation goes from the infinite many into one. So radiation and gravitation, which are inversions of each other, one is light and one is going to dark, um, underlie much of this universe, light and dark, yeah. you might say. So that's a law of the one to many. But that has application in sociology, for instance. When you're... Uh, when you're amongst a, you're, you're isolated from a group, you want to find a group to fit in. Mm. But once you find the group and fit into it, you want to stand out. Mm -hmm. So as you move towards one, you also want to diversify into many, and find your own uniqueness. Um, you have monarchies, democracies. When you're dating many people, you're trying to find that special one. Once when you, you get, found the one, you're bored. You're bored, you wonder what <laughs> the hell the idea. others are doing, yeah. right. So this law of the one to many, it's also called the law of similarities and differences. It's a law of the peace and war, or cooperation and competition, or build and destroy. It's a conservation law, it's a symmetry law that, that applies in every field so far I've studied. And so that's a very, I, I define a universal law as something that is universally applicable. And, and macro, micro scales in between, uh, and also in all the different disciplines, which are just views of the universe, you might say. So that would be one. Now, you asked about the secret, and that was about the and law, the law of, attraction. of attraction. Yes, I, I'm, I'm not as mystical about the law of attraction. I think of the law of attraction as 
that when you really are pursuing something that's really high on your values, mm -hmm. the pulvinar nuclei in the thalamus, which is a subcortical brain area, is a gate or filtering mechanism. And based on what you value most, it filters your sensory perceptions in a way that allows you to maximize the attainment of whatever it is that's highest on your value. So if you're a mother and you have three children and they're all under the age of five and you're really focused on those children, if you walk in a mall, if your highest value is your children, you will spot children's clothes, children's entertainment, children's education, children's health items in the mall. So you will spot things and they'll jump out at you because of your filtering mechanism in the thalamus, you'll spot that and you'll delete the other stuff. It'll go unconscious. Mm. So you filter things. But if you're attempting to live by lower values in your value list, mainly because you're trying to subordinate to other people and live and please other people and you know, live in the shadows of people instead of true to yourself, you'll set goals that aren't really high in your values and the filtering system is not as strong. And so you won't see opportunities, you won't see the synchronicities, and you won't take actions and make decisions effectively. And so the secret will think, you'll think, well, the secret's not working for me. So you have to know what's really valuable to you, and to the degree that you do, and to the degree that you prioritize your actions and prioritize your, your, your life, you maximize what we call the law of attraction, which is the increasing probabilities of achieving what you set out for. So the secret starts with finding out your true values. You're In my opinion, the secret... Now, when they filmed The Secret, I got filmed for seven and a half hours for about two minutes. And, uh, but I reiterated that all through that, but that never got into that. It never got into the movie. never got into it because it was, I guess, too technical or something. But the reality is that, that if you set goals that are aligned and congruent with what you truly value, you spontaneously are inspired intrinsically to take action on them and you have the highest probability of achieving them. And you have the highest awareness factor because of the filtering of the information that allows you to achieve it. So you literally feel like you're working in the flow when you're living by that highest mm, value. Completely. So, so there is a synchronicity there and your innermost dominant thought does become your outermost tangible reality because it's highest on your value because it's the way the brain is set up. The brain is set up to fulfill that highest value. So what would you say, because I think a lot of people maybe str or struggle with figuring out their purpose. I was in corporate life for 20 years. Um, it paid the bills. I climbed the ladder. I sort of did everything that I thought I should do as growing up, and, and I was very successful. But I felt extremely unfulfilled, and I felt like there was something else in me. But I couldn't figure that out. I couldn't figure, I, I spent, I, I came out of my corporate life for, for a couple of years, tried to figure it out, and it wasn't actually, funny enough, until I did the breakthrough that I, I had that sort of aha moment. How do you get people to awaken? Every human being has a set of priorities, a set of values that they live their life by, moment by moment. And even though these set of values are evolving and changing, at that moment, every perception, decision, and action is based on it. That's why I was saying it filters it, that pulvinar nuclei filters mm. it. So if you set a goal that is aligned with what you value most, what's highest in value, that is the most intrinsic value that you spontaneously will act upon. You are reliable, you're disciplined, and you're focused there. But if you try to set a goal that's as on lower values, it becomes more extrinsic, and you need incentives to keep you staying focused on it. Motivation is You need cool. motivation. Yes. Uh, yeah. Instead of inspiration yeah. from within, it's external motivation. Mm. And if you need motivation to do what you say is important, what you say is important isn't important. I don't require motivation to do what I love doing. I, I, I research, write, travel, teach. I, 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 I completely don't need that. understand that. I mean, people say to me, um, how do you have the time to go to the gym? Yeah. And I'm, the answer is simple. It's a non-negotiable for me. I make time. It's high on your values. It's high on my yeah. When it's high on your values... I, I delegate so workouts to other specialists. <laughs> I do a little bit. I work out my mouth. mouth. I was on Very the front, good at that. <laughs> front cover of Blab magazine, not Ab magazine. But, but um, whatever is highest on your value, you truly do have a spontaneous inspiration to take action on. Everyone has that. But what happens is people often compare themselves to people on the mm. outside. They look up to people they think is more intelligent, more successful, more wealth, more stable relationship, more socially influential, more physically fit, more spiritually aware. And the second they compare themselves to others, instead of comparing their daily actions to their own highest value, they automatically inject 
and inculcate other people's values into life and cloud the clarity of their own calling. And the highest value is the purpose. That's the calling. And, and so I have a value determination process, you know, as my website. Yes. And it's a 13 questionnaire process that helps you look at your life objectively and look at what you spontaneously do that nobody has to remind you to do. And until you can get honest with yourself and look objectively at your life and look at what you spontaneously do that nobody ever has to remind you to do and start from that and start structuring your life through delegating other things and primary focus on that, you won't build momentum incrementally to do something extraordinary with it. And then you'll end up living shoulds, ought to's, supposed to's, got to's, have to's, must. And you said, I felt I had should do that. And you were doing what you should. And that's an internal conflict with what your calling is. So we're not here to live by shoulds and ought to's and supposed to's and got to's and have to's and must, which are deontological mm -hmm. duties instead of callings. So if we look carefully at what a person is really, really demonstrating on a daily basis that they're inspired to do, and we start structuring a life around that, we can awaken in any human being the natural born emerging leader that they have, that they're called to do. And I, that's what I love doing in Breakfast, to work on I, I that. Can't tell, I mean, it touches a chord in me because I, I, I didn't, until I did the value process and, and the work, I didn't realize how powerful it was. But I, I mean, it really does change your life when you discover when you, that. When you and discover that. that. Well, the, the Delphic Oracle was noted as saying, supposedly, uh, know thyself, be thyself, love thyself. It is absolutely true. If you, your, your identity revolves around what you value most. When you're in a relationship with somebody, they want to be loved and appreciated for who they are. And who they are is an expression of whatever that highest value is. So if you can ask how specifically is what they're dedicated to, what's highest in their value is helping you fulfill what you're dedicated to, and you can reverse that, how specific is what you're dedicated to helping fulfill what they're dedicated to, you now have a dialogue instead of an alternating monologue where you're talking, they're not listening, they're talking, you're not listening, undermining the relationship. So if you actually can communicate what you love doing in terms of what other people love doing in their highest values, the world opens up because you're helping them get what they want and they help you want to get what you want. So actually in terms of relationships, um, do you think then uh, you know, relationships can be the hardest things in the world? Do you think you need to meet somebody with your values for a relationship to you, work? You won't. If, if you have, if the way the beauty is, the universe works most sufficiently at the border of order and chaos, or the border of support and challenge. So if you went out looking for somebody that had the same values to you, you'd be oversupported and you'd be bored. And so if you went out with somebody that was complete opposite values, you'd end you'd up be having Ill. burnout. Burnout. Boredom, burnout. Imagine if a guy comes up to you and he gets on his knees, I just want to do everything you want me to do. Tell me when to do it, and I just want to be like, the, tell me how to be and everything else. You go, get a life. Yeah, exactly. Stand up. Yeah, yeah. Be Challenge a man. Me. Be a man. <laughs> you know, you're wuss. But if he goes in there and says, look, baby, you tell me, I'm do, telling you what to do. You do what I tell you. You'd also get burned out. Mm. You want somebody that is, is able to banter with you, that is, if you go up, they, they come, calm you down. If you go down, they lift you up, and they keep you in center and authentic. And that occurs when you have a balance of support and challenge. The ancient Greeks said when you have more similarities than differences, you have infatuation. And when you see more differences than similarities, you have resentment. But if you have a blend of similarities and differences, support and challenge, you have love. When you first meet somebody, though, isn't it all about infatuation? Isn't that the sort of... I won't say that in every case, most cases. Because there's some people that they don't even really have an interest in the person and it grows. Yeah. It goes, it gradually turns it. But most people let the dopamine rushes and the serotonin rushes and the fantasies of who they think that person is uh, take them away for a moment while in that early phase. And uh, that's usually unwise because the more attracted you are, the more repelled it's going to be. It's just a matter of time. They fall off a pedestal, basically. Yeah, because you got them a pedestal. And whenever you do, you tend to sacrifice you for them. And then you want your life back and you build up resentment to break that infatuation. And then it goes to the other extreme. It's wiser to to keep it balanced. I was in um, the Ritz Hotel in Paris many years ago, nearly 30 now, and Boris Becker was yes. with his, his African girlfriend. And the prince and princess of Japan had, were on their honeymoon there. And my wife and I were sitting there, and there was only six people in this restaurant, and you couldn't not hear them, because it's so quiet. And Boris and them were in a passionate frenzy, 
It was like they were they were they were ready like let's get the food over and or let's and go, go and, let's go let's go to the bedroom and eat the food <laughs> on each other, and it was very passionate. And the other two were going through a five hundred page document and turning pages and asking each other questions and using some logic. Well, the two there are now the emperor and empress of, of Japan, so they've been together t almost thirty years, twenty years or something. So you can see that those had a little bit of logic in their system, mm. not just pure passion. Pure passion is basically wanting to avoid predator and seek prey, and it looks for a pleasure, and then it discovers, oh my God, there's pain going with it. And the person that's got a little bit more of an executive function sees both sides and appreciates the support and the challenge, because you respect somebody when you have a balance of those two. Can you bring the relationship back to balance? If yeah, you can. You know. In the breakthrough experience, many people are in the infatuation phase that we calm down, or in the resentment phase and we bring it up and we bring it back into balance, and then they can have that appreciation and love for the person again. What would you say, John, to people out there that are listening to this, and they may be sat in their nine to five job, sitting in the corporate life, the rat race, and they've got a business idea, and they're, they're, they're just waiting to jump ship, but they've got mortgages to pay, they've got these bills, they've got responsibility, kids, whatever it may be, and they're just saying to themselves, you know, that's all very well and good that you're saying, oh, just follow your purpose and your passion in life, but what about the bills? Well, actually, purpose and passion are not the same. I'd like to clarify that. Okay. The word passion, in its etymology, in its root, comes from patio and pati and pasio, and, uh, which means to suffer. And most today, almost everybody out there is talking about get your passion, passion find your exactly, passion. Yeah. But if they go into the etymology, which I hope everybody who listens to this goes and looks up the word, the etymology of passion, it means to suffer because it's an animal behavior of trying to avoid pain and seek pleasure, trying to avoid predator and seek prey. That's why the, the deadly sins of Christianity were gluttony, sloth, you know, greed, lust, all the pleasure without pain right. approaches. And those are the sufferings because you're striving for that which is unavailable and trying to avoid that which is unavoidable. And that's the source of human suffering, as the Buddha says. But there's an inspired mission, not a passion, to an individual who lives by their highest value. When you try to live by lower values, you go into passion. When you try to live by the highest values, you go into an inspired mission, which is intrinsic, not extrinsically driven. How do you know the difference? If you have to ask the question, it's passion, because you'll have certainty when it's a mission. Yeah. Now, if a person's in a job they're not inspired by, if they go and jump radically over into something else without a net, without a plan or whatever, that's dangerous and probably foolish. A bit silly, really, yeah. So people make decisions based on what they think will give them the greatest advantage or disadvantage at any moment in time. And unless you stack up more advantages on the new pathway than the one, you're going to stay where you are. And even though you may bitch and have a fantasy about how this is going to be, that's, that's the symptom of not doing a due diligent plan and a business plan. If you do, the purpose of a business plan is to mitigate the, 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 the risks so you can break the fantasy, so you can have an objective pathway to follow to actually move forward in your career instead of being trapped. So if you actually know that you're going to want to do something else, don't fantasize about it. Get into motion and put a business plan together where you know this is what you're going to do, this is the next step, this is the next step, here's the risk, here's how we're going to handle it. You've mitigated the risk, you thought through it with foresight, you, you've broken out the fantasy so it's not real, because if you have a fantasy, you're going to hate your job even more. But if you've gone through and made an objective, a true objective out of it, and then ask how specifically is the job I'm doing now, right now, which is not a mistake, it's a stepping stone, how's it helping me get there? Then you'll actually appreciate the transition and you'll do a reasonable transition to get there and realize this isn't in the way, it's just on the way. But are there those people that go and start businesses and they put everything into it, they hustle, and before you know it, they're burnt out, they've worked hard, but it just hasn't worked, and they end up not enjoying most cases, they went out there with a fantasy idea, sort of a self-righteous, arrogant idea of what the world needs, according to what they think it needs, projected it onto society without checking what the world needs. You're not going to have a very viable business trying to sell something people don't want. You need to go out and do some market research and find out what people are looking for. And if you have no demand, it's hard to push things uphill. So many times people have a fantasy based on their own needs that that's what the world wants, and they project it onto the world and they pay a price. So that's what the purpose of a business plan is, to make sure you do due diligence, make sure you find out what the real needs are, find out what it's going to cost to provide those needs effectively and efficiently in a competitive manner, and then make sure you've got your plan in operation before you jump. And if you do, you're less likely. 
Doesn't guarantee it, but it's less likely to fall on your face. And what do you say to people if they're just looking at make, looking to make money? So it's just like, look, this is a great business plan, but I'm going to make loads and loads of money from it. Well, people that make money without meaning usually end up in debauchery. I don't promote it. I think that you need to find something that is deeply meaningful to you. Because you know when you're doing this show, for instance, or when you're doing service for people and you actually know you're making a difference and people come up and say, thank you, you've made a trajectory difference. Nothing to do with money. It, well, it, it, you deserve to get paid for it. This is not like it doesn't have anything to do with money. You want a fair exchange. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a deep meaning there, and it means something you've yeah. made that difference. Yes. I, I had a dinner and lunch with a gentleman who made $75 million a year. That's a good income. That's one of the best yeah. incomes. Yeah. Okay? Now, this gentleman had a series of media um, tabloids that he owned, which sell a lot. They're some of the biggest mm -hmm. sellers, the tabloids. And this gentleman uh, drank 18 drinks during lunch. Wow, lunch. Yeah, because he had <laughs> no that. meaning in his work. It was purely a money-making yeah. system that had no meaning in his life. He didn't feel like he made any difference. But I also know people like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett that have fortunes, but they do something meaningful on a daily basis that they love doing. You don't see debauchery there. You don't see uh, um, a living your life to escape. They see it leaving life to fulfill something meaningful. So I'm a firm believer in finding something that serves people's needs, but not at the expense of yours, and not trying to do something that's just for what you want, narcissistically, that doesn't serve people's needs. You have to find an equity between what you would love to do and what people would love to get. When you find that, you found your niche, you found meaning, and you found something you can't wait to get up in the morning and do. Beautiful. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, going forward with, with what you're doing. I mean, you now, I don't know, how many times do you actually run the breakthrough experience a year? On average, 43 times. 43 times. Yeah, and 43. Is that in about, and I read a statistic, it was about, was it 150 countries that you cover? Or? No, I've been to 153 by the end of the year, 153 countries. But I have done the breakthrough experience in 63 and probably 64. I think we're going to do a new, new country in, in, um, coming up. So if, if we do it there, it'll be 64. If not, it'll still be 63. I'm not sure yet. I've got to say, I mean, as I've said before, it completely changed my life. I mean, not only did I really find my purpose and passion, but I made breakthroughs over um, families, my family, my, what I was telling myself all my life, uh, and completely changed the way I looked at things. Uh, actually, to the point of, I mean, I think this should be taught in schools. I don't know if there's a... Well, there are some, some of my, my facilitators that have learned the methods and are using it in schools, which I think gives them a competitive advantage, the, the youth. But, yeah, I've done the Breakthrough Experience 1,080 times. Wow. And how do you support people after the event? Because, the, obviously, the event, you, you come away feeling that you can balance things out. Um, do you find that people keep that balance after they've left the event? Well, they, they've now got a tool, the Demartini Method, on how to take whatever happens in their life and turn it into something they can be grateful for. And, and, and Because it's about the quality of your life based on the quality of the questions you ask, and it's a series of questions that make you see the hidden order in the apparent chaos of life. So some people take it and run with it, and some people are, no, they just went to a seminar and that was their entertainment. But we now are adding new things into it to try to make sure that there's follow-up, there's now a support, I won't call it a support group, but it's a, it's a community of people that are involved in that around the world. So now when they do it, they're, they're part of that. So they have people to interact with around the world that are keeping them, and they, they get feedback and that assist them in maintaining that focus. There's also online information that we now also provide. Yes. I mean, your, on, your website's amazing. As a font of knowledge, you can get download you so could, much You could spend the rest of your life reading my website. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's in Finnish. It's never done. <laughs> But um, no, there, I think it's just like anything else. You, you have some people that um, it's more resonant with and they, they, they go and they, they, this is, this is, they found what they're looking for and they just take off with it. They do amazing things with it. And others are testing out like shopping. Mm -hmm. They'll go and test, they go, oh, I like that. No, I don't know. And they, they go in and out of it. I have a whole gradation of people that attend the program. But we try to meet as many needs as we can, and we try to provide more more as we go along. And we're learning as we go. I mean, I'm, I've only been doing it 30 years. <laughs> so I'm, as you go, you learn something each time. One of the most powerful things I saw you do um, was help somebody with their grief yes. and their loss. Tell me a little bit more about how you help people with that. Well, I developed a method. I started it in 1984, but I developed a method um, 
then it dissolves grief. And uh, it's mind-blowing, really. I've, yeah. I've actually taken 3,585 people through the death grief process. So they had somebody that died, and they're grieving, and I show them how to dissolve it. We had the opportunity to do it in Christ Church after the earthquake there. We were brought in for that, for the town hall. Wow, so you did it in front of the whole, whole community? Whole, yeah, we do it in front of the community. We did it in Ishinomaki in Japan after the tsunami. We went in there where, at ground zero where awesome. the people were. Awesome. Amazing. One building that was there. We did it also a couple of years ago at the big Japanese earthquake. Mm. We were asked, they asked us to come on that one. And now they've done some research at Keio University. Professor Maino and Shoga have now done research on that method. And so far they've found 100% effective. So it's, I'm really inspired to see that they've proven it, even though I've known it for, since 84. And it's a science on, on dissolving grief. I, I discovered what grief was. I understand the chemistry, the brain function of it. I figured out what it is and now I've got a solution for it. So we don't have to have grief ever again, more than three hours ever again in history. And you've had your own experience of grief. Um, your wife died of, of cancer. Well, actually, uh, when she passed away, I got to firsthand use the method. So as she was starting to fade, we found out she was going to be passing in October, and they gave her maybe 60 days, 90 days to live. She died in December. And so as I was watching, as things were fading in her life, things that we normally did were disappearing, I used the process all along the way. And just to, because I, it's my opportunity to get firsthand experience to helping other people and also how to keep and maintain love and appreciation for her all the did, way through. Did she know you were doing it? Yeah, did no, you talk she understood. She, yeah. She's used the word. So as a result of doing it, by the time she passed, there was no grief. There was just a deep love and presence. And I don't know if people can comprehend that when they first, it's they've so, never seen so it. It's so difficult to understand. It's, it's hard to comprehend because people, see, I'll, I'll use this analogy and this will help people understand it. When Saddam Hussein passed away, in America, because people had a skewed uh, resentment to some of the behavior, according to our propaganda, people were celebrating in the streets his death. There was not mourning. But in Iraq, for those that were more infatuated with him and appreciative of him that way, they um, were grieving. So I've observed that we have two forms of grief. Grief comes from the withdrawal and the loss from that which we attach to, attract to, or infatuate with. So the, in other words, the, the loss of that which we seek causes grief, or the gain of that which we try to avoid. So in the amygdala, which is a subcortical brain area, uh, it's the animal behavior is if predator comes towards us or prey gets away from us, we have grief. If prey comes towards us and we get to eat and predator goes away from us, we have relief. So it's actually a biological response to things we seek or avoid. So if we are neutral and have no seek or avoid, there's no grief or relief. So what I do is I show people how to take whatever they think they've just lost, identify what they've lost, and in every case since 1984, they only have a loss of the things that they were attracted to. They never say, well, I miss their yelling. I miss their screaming. Well, yeah. They only miss the things that they were infatuated with. So we itemize every single thing that they think they miss, that they're grieving the loss of. We then show them who in, in their life is now manifesting that. We think we've lost something, but that's because we're attached to the form. Once we identify the new forms that emerge, because new people take on those yeah, roles. Yes, Once we see the new form of it and quantify it, where it's quantity that's equal, quantity and quality is equal, then we go and we take the drawback side of the first thing that we were infatuated with, that we were attracted to, and show them the unconscious downsides of that behavior. Because every behavior has two sides, but you're only conscious of one at a time usually. So when I show them the downsides and I level that and bring the downsides equal to the upsides without making anything up, just observing, and then the benefits of the new form that's now transformed into, and level those, it's impossible for them to have grief. And it's dissolved. And I've been doing that for since 84. But what about the, and even looking at the actual person that's Doesn't disappeared? Doesn't I can show them a picture after that, there's no grief. I've been doing it successfully since then and got a 100% rate, rate on it. And they just did the research. They, and I saw you do it in person and it was, it was absolutely Yeah, we do it again say, this weekend. Was, we do it every weekend. It was mind-blowing. We but actually, if people are listening to it, they would probably don't understand until yeah, they we're actually... Working it. We're actually writing a book on it right now. It's in the making now. And uh, we've done videos on it. I've done it on television. I've done it radio, I've done it many different places. 
But we've been doing it 3,585 different deaths. I've taken care of that way. And it's hard to comprehend because people are living in the old paradigm that you're supposed to grieve. There's, it's absolutely biologically not to your advantage to be grieving. Prolonged grieving actually increases cancers, cardiovascular disease, digestive systems, immune deficiencies. It's not to our advantage to have prolonged grief. It's wiser to go in there, neutralize it, and love the person, feel the presence of the person, and honor them. Because when you die, you have no desire for them to grieve, mm -hmm. the people you care about. Yeah. You have a desire for them to live their life to the fullest. So it's sort of a selfish act that we get addicted to because of social pressure and also because we are attached and infatuated with parts of them. And our own fear of death is coming from our own fear of the loss of the things we're proud of. Because when you're actually resentful to yourself and feeling shamed and you're beating yourself up and depressed, you actually think about taking your life. You don't have the fear of death. You don't have a grief over the loss of your life then. So you can eradicate your own fear you of can death. All, by you can eradicate your own death by, by dissolving your own infatuations with yourself, the things you're proud of in yourself. I, I, I mean, that's fascinating. Have you done that on yourself? Oh, yes. And what I, I got the opportunity to do a Kubler-Ross, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was the one on death and dying. She's the one that's a leader in that field. And when she was getting ready to go through the passing process, I was actually uh, the one that brought Presumably you can't eradicate the fear of pain, though physical well, pain, pain. pain and pleasure are also pairs of opposites. And Anaxagoras wrote about that 2,600 years ago. He was the one that, he was one of the Pythagorean derivatives, Anaximander, Anaxagoras, Anaximenes. And they, he wrote about it, and to this day, he's, he's written some of the best stuff on pain ever. And John Bonica, who was a professor and leading professor on pain research, honored his work and showed that you cannot have pain without pleasure or pleasure without pain. They're always paired. But one's conscious, one's unconscious. So if I bring them both into full consciousness, poof, they poof. So the pain, the pain you disappears. Can change it. I used to do it with cancer patients in my clinic. And I used to watch them and show them, and they could take osteosarcoma, and their legs were just brittle, and they're falling apart, and they're just eroding with osteoclasis. I could go in there, and I could take, and, and I would find out the representation of the brain over the pain and ask new questions, make them have new representations, and all of a sudden they go, I can't feel the pain. Because it's a representation in the thalamus before it goes to the cortex. If it's changed the representation, it's not, not perceived. I saw you do something, um, uh, actually it was a couple of years ago, at the, uh, the S Group, um, and you, we were talking about mind-body connection. And there was a guy in the audience and he was suffering with severe headaches. And you literally, with questions, drilled down to the point where he was in tears and he understood. What was the source of it? What was the source of it? The internal conflict he had. And you... Just by questions, I mean, I thought, again, amazing. By questioning, he completely understood where those headaches were coming from and how they started. Yes, I just did and that just a few days ago. We had a lady that was having internal conflicts and migraine headaches, and we narrowed down what the conflict was, and it was poofed. So there is a mind-body connection? Unquestionably. You cannot have a change in perception without having a change in neurotransmitters and modulators, regulators, and hormones. You cannot have that without change in receptor site activation. You cannot have that without having cascade enzyme changes and literally epigenetic changes on genes and proteins in the body. You cannot have a perception change without a physiological change. Impossible. So what's your views on stress as a, in terms of what, what it affects it has on the well, body? Well, there's only two forms of stress, distress that ever exist. People think they've got all these different stress, but there's only two forms. To the brain. The perception of loss of that which you seek and the perception of gain of that which you're trying to avoid. Think of a stress. Pick any stress. Not be a, uh, not looking good. I mean, for me, go back to my values. Um, it would be not looking your best. Yes. Not okay. Looking okay best. So if you it's look in the mirror and it's not, uh, uh, it's a bad hair day or whatever, and it's not, <laughs> you're not looking your best. You feel you're having a loss of that which you seek. Yeah. Or a gain of that which you don't want. Yes. Pick another stress. Financial stress. Financial stress. Okay. Yes. Uh, a huge tax bill. Okay, so anytime you have, now can you see you don't want bills coming to you? I definitely You're don't trying to avoid that. So yes. anytime something comes onto you, you're trying to avoid stress. Or if some client that was paying you all of a sudden disappears, you have a loss of that which you seek. Every stress, distress that a human being is going to face, distress, not use stress, but distress, comes from the perception of loss of that which you seek and a gain of that which you're trying to avoid. Every distress known. I think people are going to have to rewind that and listen to that over and over again because that's you know the biggest yeah, thing. Because out it, there. The, it's a it's a normal response to predator and prey in our brain. Except now the predator is anything that challenges our values, and a prey is anything that supports our values. We just have more diversified values than just an animal out in the wild.
seeking an animal and trying to avoid an animal. We have now more predator things in our life and more prey things in life because anything we desire is a prey. Anything we're desiring to avoid is a predator. And as the Buddha says, the desire for that which is unobtainable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is a source of human it's suffering. Yeah. That's where passion is. That's why passion is polarizing the mind and trying to avoid half and try to get the other half. And many people are trying to get rid of half their life to love themselves, and it won't ever happen. You've got to love all sides of yourself, both sides of yourself. Oh. Can't love yourself Amazing. if you're trying to get rid of half of yourself. Can't love life if you're trying to get rid of half of life. Yeah. Amazing. So where do you see, what legacy or what do you want to leave behind, John? I want to continue to research, write, travel, teach, and reach more people, get more information out, and continue that, and have that continue on beyond my life. My daughter's taking on some of it. My team and Carissa's taking on some of that. There's people around the world that are taking on, facilitators taking on. Just continue to get the work out there. Although I, I'm, I wanted to create original ideas that served humanity. I've been working all these 47 years for that objective. And, and you know, having witnessed and been a part of it and having it change my life, I'd like to do something. Is there anything that I can do to help you? Well, you're doing it right now. We're doing it. <laughs> We're getting a message out. And we'll get in the show notes the links to the website because yes. all the information is on the, in the website. It's amazing. Um, I know you've just done your breakthrough. Are you doing another breakthrough in London? Not this. this time. We'll be back in February. In February. In February, I'll be back 2020. I'm doing a training program here that's going to be a five-day training program, training another about 90 facilitators to help share my work around the world. And, um, and then I'll be back in February to do uh, the Breakthrough Experience again. But I'll be doing one. I mean, I, I travel. F we do 43. I've done up to 45 in a year. The rest of the weekends, I do the other programs. I have 76 courses that I teach, so I keep busy. But... Um, what do you do in your spare time? For, uh, research, for, write, travel, teach. For laughs and giggles. Re research, write, travel, teach. So, so to enjoy life, you pick up a book? Well, that's what I love doing. When I go on my ship, I live on a ship, and when I go on my ship, I usually am reading. That's, reading and writing is what I love doing there. Great. Yeah. John, my last question, I ask this to all my guests. If you were to leave a message in a bottle for future generations to find, what would that message be? I'd leave the method itself, my Martini method. That's fantastic. And, and that is actually already left in a, the Milk Abbey to be it's stored there for a thousand years. So I've been blessed to have it actually sealed into um, So it scrolled. actually is a message. It's, it's, actually a, it's actually in a stainless steel cylinder in an Infinity of Divinity room at the Milk Abbey in a sealed, vacuum sealed system that will be there for a thousand years. So that was wow. there because I did a presentation there on conflict resolution and the use of the method and that they did that. That, that was a gift they gave me. So it's done. But I, I'd like to continue to see the work continue. That's okay. all. John, thank you very much for being on my show. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like and you'll get it straight into your inbox. <laughs>